very good morning to all of you. Uh, I am Professor Deepan Ghosh and uh, uh, along with my colleagues uh, Professor Shiv Prashad and Professor K. G. Suresh, uh, we will be conducting uh, this workshop for the next 10 days. But uh, we have uh, another uh, couple of uh, colleagues, I would now introduce them because they will be engaging some of the uh, tutorial sessions and will be also helping us to um, you know uh, formulate quizzes etc. So uh, to my left is uh, Varun Gandhi uh, and uh, uh, he will be taking up some tutorial sessions on various subjects and to next to him is Atul Kedia. Uh, so these two friends will be with me and with uh, other colleagues of mine uh, to uh, take us through this course. Uh, let me uh, go to the uh, subject of the, I will be teaching, uh, taking a few lectures on electricity magnetism. So let me quickly tell you what am I going to be covering uh, in these next uh, few days on the electricity magnetism. The first thing which uh, most students find it a uh, little confusing is um, what is this field? So I will be talking today about what the concept of the field and we will see that there are um, fields which have different characteristics, uh, only about two of them we will be interested in talking about the scalar field and the vector field. We will be talking about its mathematical representation and I will attempt uh, to give you uh, within this uh, lecture itself, namely within the next one hour a crash course on vector calculus. I have written half an hour but on the other hand it will probably take the whole lecture there. And this is very important uh, for your students that uh, irrespective of uh, the course that they might have done in mathematics, uh, you uh, have an introductory class on the vector calculus itself uh, because uh, uh, having together uh, all the concepts of vector calculus that a physicist needs for this course is an extremely important uh, point. Now once I have done the uh, course on vector calculus, uh, I will be going over and reviewing for you uh, the uh, electric field, the concept of electric field and the potential. And uh, of course, uh, I will spend quite a bit of a time on uh, electrostatics, talking about electric flux, Gauss's law, properties of conductors and dielectrics. Now that uh, would uh, complete our uh, coverage of electrostatics. Having done electrostatics, I go over to the discussion of magnetostatics. Uh, the magnetic field as we will see is uh, uh, in its character quite different from the electric field. Uh, we will see that while an electric field source has to be a charge, a magnetic field can be produced by a charge only when the charge is in motion. One of the very important applications of the electromagnetic field is uh, the charged particles behavior in uh, electric and the magnetic field which we will be talking about in detail. I will be talking then go over to steady currents and talk about what is the force on a current carrying conductor, the concept of potential energy of a magnetic dipole. Now having done this, uh, we talk about uh, go over to a discussion of Faraday's law and electromagnetic induction and uh, briefly talk about displacement current, bring in um, a concept which students find difficult to understand uh, namely vector potential and finally ending this program with a discussion of electromagnetic waves. A natural extension of this is to um, uh, take us to um, applications to optics which I will be covering in another four lectures in the following week. So with that uh, introduction, uh, let me uh, talk about the concept of a field. So my question is, what is a field? So let me try to begin uh, 
a difference between an ordinary scalar or an ordinary vector with uh, the concept of a field. So look at this room. Uh, you know that uh, in principle uh, this room for instance uh, at every point in this room I can define a temperature. Now of course uh, very um, loosely speaking we say that the temperature of this room let us say at this moment in Bombay could be something like 31, 32 degrees. But when we make that statement that the temperature of the room is let us say 32 degrees what I mean is that is an average sense. The, the temperature that we talk about are in an average sense. However, that technically every point in this room has uh, a different temperature and this is very much uh, uh, apparent to you instead of looking at an air conditioned room like this, if you were to look at for instance uh, the kitchen in your house. Now in the kitchen, uh, when you are closer to the um, uh, oven or stove, you know that the temperature is much more. When you go towards the window, the temperature decreases. So in other words, kitchen is a place where you can see that various parts of the room have different temperatures. Now so the temperature as we know is a scalar. So temperature being a scalar, so, so this is a scalar and when I am talking about the defining uh, the temperature at every region in a given space as I said this room for instance. So uh, if you define a temperature at the function of uh, let us say the point x, y, z in a certain region of space, I can call this though this language is not very much used that my room then is a place in which a temperature field exists. Now this is temperature but on the other hand I could think of other scalar variables which are defined in a certain region of space. So the it is a scalar which has a definite value at every point. Now this is an example of what I can call as a scalar field. So temperature for example is a scalar field. Now let us go to the what we are going to be using more often, uh, we would be more interested in talking about a vector field because the electric field or the magnetic field they are all vector fields. So now what is the difference between the two fields? First let us try to understand the difference between a scalar and a vector. As we know that uh, a vector differs from scalar in the sense that the a vector is characterized by both a magnitude and a direction. Now so therefore when I am talking about a vector field I am still doing the same thing as I did in case of a temperature that at every point in a region of space I have a definite value for a quantity accepting that unlike temperature this quantity has both a magnitude and a direction. So uh, typical examples of course we will be discussing a lot about um, electric field or a magnetic field but let us say the more familiar one to everybody is the gravitational field. Now how is the gravitational field 
you look at again uh, a certain region of space, let us say this room. Now, we say for example, gravity which arises due to the gravitational pull of the earth, we very frequently make a statement that uh, the acceleration due to gravity, let us say in this room is 9.8 meter per second square. But, but that statement is again an average approximate statement. Now, technically speaking before or any different points in this room are at different distances from the earth's mass distribution. So, though it may not be measurable, but every point in this room or uh, let us say in uh, your campus would have a different value of the gravity, gravitational field due to the earth uh, both in magnitude and in direction, but of course, because the in the scale of the earth these things are not all that big, you will not be in a position to uh, measure the difference. But nevertheless, the gravity is indeed defined at every point and it has in principle a different value at different points either in magnitude or in direction or both. So, gravitational field is an example of a vector field. I am of course, stating at this moment that the electric field and the magnetic field are also examples of vector fields, but of course, since this would be the content of my course here, I will be carrying on with them later. So, therefore, to summarize, I said field is a scalar or a vector quantity whose value is defined at every point in a certain region of space. The room for example, the example I gave you is a seat of temperature field in which a scalar is defined at every point in the room. There is an example of a scalar field. The, now, so likewise for a vector field, we assign to each point a vector quantity which supposing I am looking at in two dimensions, it is a function of x y, but it is a directed quantity and in three dimension it is a function of x y z, but again it is a directed quantity. Examples as I pointed out to you are the gravitational field and the electric field. So, let us look at how does one visualize this. I will, I will try to first uh, uh, the screen is of course, in front of you, but let me illustrate this by an example. Now, let us suppose I have a vector field in two dimension, I am doing it in two dimension because I am in a position to sketch it. So, let me take that vector field to be given by, so vector f to be given by uh, let us say uh, y times i minus 2 x times j. So, this is the vector field and uh, so let, let me see how does one visually sketch this. So, the first thing to do is this since I am plotting a vector, I will require to fix some units. So, we could decide for example, that this would be a uh, nice unit to uh, have for one unit. And, uh, so, let us let us try to draw a two dimensional graph. So, this is my x and this is my y. So, for instance, if I look at uh, the point let us say 0 1. Now, at the point 0 1 which is uh, of course, here the, the if you plot x is equal to 0 y is equal to 1, you notice that f is simply equal to i. So, therefore, since it is 1 i, I, I plot it with an arrow and I said okay, this is the length here. Similarly, supposing you went to 0 2, uh, at the point 0 2, uh, this is 2 i. So, I just go one step further and draw another line along the x direction which is twice the length and like this we could go. Likewise, if I want to plot it at 0 minus 1, it is equal to minus i. So, therefore, it would be something like this and like this and so on and so forth. 
Now, when I come to the point, uh, let us say a different point, let us say point 1, 2. So, the point 1, 2 is, uh, if, so if this is 1, this is 2, so this is the point 1, 2 there and at, at the point 1, 2, this is 2i minus 2j. So, look at that. So, you try to draw a arrow, directed arrow of that length in the direction of 2i minus 2j. So, this uh, uh, screen which you could see, I have listed a few, um, the values of the field yi minus 2xj at certain points, I mean these are representative points, but of course, you could take a graph paper and draw this whole thing out. But this is the drawing that I made uh, with uh, my hand uh, taking some representative values that you have taken and this is something which you can ask your students uh, to be able to do. But since today our students are much more savvy at computers, you will be able to ask them to take up a mathematical uh, computer like for example, a Mathematica or a Maple or things like that and draw uh, sketch. Now, this is this is a mathematical plot of the same uh, uh, vector field that I showed you and so therefore, this sort of tells you about this is of course, a two dimensional picture you can get such pictures in three dimensions also using a Mathematica and they look really beautiful and you can sort of get a feel of what the field is. All right. So, let me uh, now go a little more to the properties of uh, the, now we have said that a vector field is defined at every point in certain region of space and like a scalar function and the only difference is it also has in addition to a magnitude, it also has a uh, direction. Now, since it is a function which like an ordinary scalar function has different values at different points or basically saying that it is a function which is defined at various points. Now, I can treat it like uh, and I can subject it to processes such as integration, differentiation and things like that. And in fact, what I am going to do now is to do both. And firstly, because the vector field has both magnitude and direction at every point, I while defining an integration or a differentiation, remember integration is nothing but a sum. So, therefore, if I am looking at an integration of vector fields, then the result that I get will be essentially a directed quantity unless I happen to do some operation with it to make it a scalar. And so, therefore, the it is not just like uh, a uh, scalar field, but its differentiation or integration has to take care of due to the fact that these are directed quantities. So, let us continue with that. So, let me first define what is known as the line integral of a vector field. So, a, now what we said is this that here I have a let me do it this way. Supposing this is the way let us say my vector field is there. I will show you a better picture when I go over to the monitor. And so, this is the direction of the vector field let us suppose this is f. Now, I want to integrate it. Now, I want to integrate it along a path, supposing this is my path. So, this is the path along which I want to do the integration. So, what I do is this. Now, notice supposing I'm, I want to do, remember that the vector field is defined at every point. So, therefore, it is defined all along this path. So, let, let me take uh, this point for instance. The, now, at this point, my path direction is along the tangent. Let me call it d l direction. And the vector direction is of course, as you notice that field direction is this. So, there is an angle which f makes with d l, which of course, I will call it as theta. So, the point is this that I define a line integral, a line integral along this path 
by first looking at a small length element d l, which is as I said is directed like this and every point along this path, the direction of the line element is along the tangent. So, therefore, at every point I can define a quantity which is dot product of f with this d l. And if I take it along this path which is saying that take it along this contour, then this is my definition of the line integral of a vector field along the contour. Right? So, this is a better picture of what I tried to uh, do on my paper. You can see that green path that you see is the path along which I am trying to integrate and the blue uh, directions are the directions of the field there. Uh, the uh, direction of d l at a point uh, where uh, I have shown the um, direction of the field as well as the direction of the uh, length element d l separately, they make an angle theta and if you do that at every point in space, add it up because integral is nothing but an addition, you get the definition of a uh, line integral. Having done the line integral, uh, let me now go over to uh, the concept of a surface integral. Now, the surface integral, uh, but before I go to the concept of surface integral, let me sort of recollect for you and which you should always do that when you teach in a class is that an area can be under certain circumstances regarded as a vector. Now, the reason why um, area can be regarded as a vector is the following. I will come back to the screen, but first let me explain. Uh, the reason why area can be regarded as a vector is because uh, you remember that the definition of a vector is that it is a quantity which has both magnitude and direction. Now, area certainly has a magnitude, but the question is does it have a direction? Uh, that you would normally say that area does not seem to have a direction. But this is not true if you look at a small enough area so that it can be regarded as essentially flat. Now, if you look at an area element ds, it is essentially a flat thing and uh, so if you have a perfectly two dimensional flat quantity, you can uniquely associate a direction with it and that direction is the direction which is perpendicular to that surface area. So, therefore, to this surface element with this surface element I have associated a magnitude which is just nothing but the area in some units like meter square, centimeter square or whatever and a direction which is along the direction which is perpendicular to that surface area. Now, there is a small problem there. The problem is that if you have a flat surface, the direction of the normal is not unique because the normal could be coming out of that surface or it could be going into that surface. So, therefore, what we do is take a make a convention. We say that the direction of an area element is given by the outward normal that is the normal which is perpendicular to it of course, but is going out of that surface not into that surface. So, this is a convention nothing would go wrong if you were to take the other convention, but the entire physics uses this convention. So, therefore, we also use it. Now, let us look at the concept of a surface integral now. Now, that we have talked about the uh, principle that is uh, an area element or a surface element can be regarded as a vector. Now, I can now talk about a surface integral. Now, is the best understood by this picture that I am showing on the screen and this is you imagine that through this surface. In the first case, I have put that surface perpendicular to the direction of the, uh, the left picture. I have put it as perpendicular to the direction of the vector field. Imagine this vector field to be uh, a, the fluid flowing through that surface. So, what I have done is I have water or some other fluid flowing and um, take it as a streamline motion and put a surface area perpendicular to that. So, Notice that in this case that I have shown that direction of the surface element and the direction of the 
uh, rect field which is velocity field in this case are parallel to each other. Now, suppose I uh, take the second picture, the right hand side picture, there uh, the uh, surface area is inclined to the direction of the vector and uh, I define the surf flux that is the name that physics people will be using as the dot product of the vector field with the surface element uh, where I am doing the calculation. So, this is the flux is f dotted with d s which is the surface element times the field magnitude times the angle cosine of the angle between this. So, we have been able to do it because we regarded surface element as vector. For an arbitrary surface the third picture is showing you the direction of an outward normal which of course, for this type of a surface will vary from point to point. Another thing that we need to be very careful about when we talk about surface integral, see the there are different types of surfaces. Now, the surface I am talking about must be two sided and not one sided. Now, you would say what is a one sided surface? I will give you an example of a one sided surface. For example, Mobius strip is a one sided surface. On the left uh, figure here, I am showing a normal Fisherman's net which is obviously a two sided surface. This is because there is an inside and there is an outside and, and this, there is a rim which sort of defines the boundary of that surface. Now, let us look at another type of surface, surface but, but realize what is meant by a two sided surface. Supposing I am on the outside surface and I want to go to the directly opposite point on the inside surface. Now, on a two sided surface there is no way of doing that unless I cross the boundary that I have to cross this rim, get underneath and then come back to a point below. Now, so therefore, this is a characteristic of a two sided surface that is that in order to go from the a point on the surface to a point directly below that surface. For example, if you take a piece of paper, then it is from the top of the paper to the bottom of the paper at the same point. Now, if you want to do that, then you have to cross the edges of the paper, in this case the edges of the rim. So, this is an example of a two sided surface. Now, you can easily construct a one sided surface to be shown to your students and this is what is known as a Mobius strip. So, in order to construct a Mobius strip, I, I will try to tell you how to, how to construct a one sided surface. So, what you do is you cut out a ribbon first. So, I have a paper ribbon, now you try to fold it. Now, you see if you just folded it like this, what you have got is a two sided surface. If I am here, I want to come to the point below, I will have to cross an edge. But supposing I did not do that, what I did is I did this and folded it back like that, making something like a figure of eight this you can easily do. Now, if I do that and you are on one side of the surface and you want to come to the bottom, now you can seamlessly do it without passing through any edge and directly come to the bottom of it. Now, so in other words, the, there are surfaces which you will be able to go from its top to the bottom side without ever crossing an edge. This example for example, is a Mobius strip which is very trivial to do, all that you need is a piece of paper and a cello tape in order to do that. Now, the surface integrals of the type I am talking about, they are applicable only to two sided surfaces and not to the one sided surface. All right. So, the flux which is basically a surface integral of the vector field is defined like that, it is only for two sided surfaces. Having done these two different integrations, namely the your surface and the uh, this integral. So, let me uh, then uh, come over to the concept of differentiation, but before I do that let us look at what is the concept of differentiation that you have in a scalar field and we will try to suitably generalize it. So, if you recall that uh, the way we defined uh, the differentiation of a uh, single variable when we are in school is to say that I take um, the value of the function at some point x plus h, subtract from it the value of the function at x, 
divide it by h and then take the limit of h going to 0. This is the class 10th or 9th definition of a differentiation, but basically what does it do? What it does is to say that take a point f x, x value of f there is x, f x and take a close enough point and uh, so value is x plus h there. So, if I do that, then this tells me that uh, if I want to write what is for example, f of x plus delta x, delta x is a neighboring point, then this is nothing but f of x plus uh, the derivative d f by d x times delta x. This will be of course, true uh, rigorously if delta x is a small uh, uh, distance. Now, so this is our idea of a one dimensional differentiation. Now, what happens in three dimension? Now, notice that the basic difference between the one dimensional differentiation and three dimensional differentiation arises because in one dimension, when I say take a neighboring point then basically I take the neighboring point either to the left or to the right that is along the same line. But in three dimension when we talk about a neighboring point, we can go in different direction. And so therefore, what we will do is to generalize it to the concept of a directional derivative. So, for example, now I have d f by d s, uh, s is a length element if you like along a particular direction. So, the point is this the by uh, similar argument that uh, uh, what we have just now given for one dimensional uh, differentiation. The only thing now is that when you want to go to a neighboring point which is separated by a length element d s. Now, you could go to that point by traveling along x keeping y and z constant then traveling along y keeping x and z constant and finally, traveling along z keeping x and y constant. So, therefore, my d f by d x, uh, d f by d s is now this is traveling along x keeping y and z constant and that is why I put it as a partial differentiation times of course, d x by d s and similarly, d f by d y, d y by d s, d phi by d z, d z by d s. Now, to illustrate let me work out the uh, directional derivative of a function f of x y. Let me take a very simple function with which you are all familiar. Let us say it is equal to x square plus y square. So, now this is this is what I just now told you that I have a I am going along a um, direction s that is done by going first along by delta x along the x direction, delta y along the y direction keeping x and z constant and delta z along the z direction keeping x and y constant and where d phi by d s is of course, given by this. So, let us look at what does the figure uh, z equal to, z is the uh, this is a uh, mathematical figure or a Gini plot figure. Uh, basically, I am trying to plot that function. The function has two variables x y which is equal to x square plus y square is my function. So, the, the value of the function is plotted along the z direction and this is the type of picture which you can generate from any of the standard packages. Now, it is a cup like structure, the, it has a cup like structure and uh, so people can get a very good view of uh, that. Yeah. Let me show you how to calculate directional derivative of this function in two different directions. For example, I will show it uh, first along a direction like i plus 2 j. Now, first thing is uh, that we have said already that uh, look at uh, x square plus y square equal to z uh, that is a cup like structure which I have shown you. So, my d f by d s is partial f by partial x dx by ds 
plus partial f by partial y d y by d s. Now, these I can calculate easily because this is a function f is being differentiated with respect to x treating y as constant. So, this is nothing but 2 x times d x by d s and likewise this is 2 y times d y by d s. Now, I need to calculate uh, this d x by d s and d y by d s along this direction for example. Now, notice along the direction i plus 2 j my x and y are related by. So, I have y is equal to 2 x is what is there which means my d y by d x is simply equal to 2. So, what is d s? d s if you remember is uh, an element of length which since I have been two dimension is given by d x square plus d y square which you can rewrite by pulling out a d x as d x times square root of 1 plus d y by d x whole square. So, that d s by d x becomes equal to root of 1 plus d y by d x whole square, but we just now showed that d y by d x is equal to 2. So, this is equal to 1 plus 4 square root which is equal to square root of 5. And, and what you could do is of course, to rewrite uh, by instead of pulling out a d x you could pull out a d y and write it as 1 plus d x by d y whole square. So, that my d s by d y can also be shown to be equal to square root of 5 by 2. So, therefore, the if I substitute these quantities, I find my d phi by d s at the point 1 2 is given by uh, your 2 x times 1 by square root of 5 which we just now calculated plus 2 y times 2 by square root of 5. And uh, I am interested in the point 1 2. So, therefore, put x is equal to 1, y is equal to 2. If you do that, this quantity works out to 2 times square root of 5. So, this is the directional derivative at that point. We will do more calculation with uh, different uh, things uh, later. So, let me then say what is this gradient. So, in defining the gradient, what I did is to say that look the since the gradient is basically connected with a with a directional derivative, what I am trying to say is that look you go along the x direction the unit vector is i the uh, variation of the function scalar function phi is dou phi by dou x that is uh, vary with respect to x keeping y z constant plus unit vector j times dou phi by dy plus unit vector k times dou phi by dz. Supposing a unit vector u is given by some a plus a i plus b j plus c k obviously, it means square root of a square plus b square plus c square is equal to 1. Supposing this is a unit vector uh, and the vector s is given by some s times the unit vector u. So, therefore, I know that this tells me that if I am going from the point x 0 y 0 z 0 to a point which is given by x 0 plus a s y 0 plus b s z 0 plus c s, then my directional derivative d phi by d s is given by uh, dou phi by dou x times a plus dou phi by dou y times b plus dou phi by dou z times c, which if you look at the way I define my gradient operator which is i d by d x actually the uh, gradient of phi I have defined there. So, it is grad phi del phi dotted with the unit vector u. So, this tells you uh, since del phi dot u is by definition remember u is a unit vector. So, it is the magnitude of del phi times magnitude of u which is equal to 1 times the uh, and cosine of the angle between 
uh, the two. So, the magnitude of the gradient is uh, nothing but the maximum magnitude of the left hand side that is the maximum magnitude of the directional derivative. And secondly, the direction of the gradient is along the direction in which the directional derivative is maximum. So, this is a very good picture which all of you can use to illustrate what is a gradient. Uh, well, you do not have to be at the top, I have shown that supposing you are at this point on the uh, hill. Now, suppose I want to come down from the hill from this point to this point. Now, notice there are many ways of doing it. I could of course, uh, be a little crazy, go up then come like this, I could come like this, but look at that there is a direction along which the slope is the steepest that is normally the path that you take and do it to come down from the hill that is come in the direction of the maximum slope and that is your the picture of the gradient. The magnitude of the gradient is well we have said that the gradient is now directed normal to a level surface. Now, level surface of a function means the surface on which the uh, function is constant. Of course, in this case, I have given you a two dimensional function. So, therefore, I will be talking about the my level surfaces are actually curves and since x square plus y square is going to is my function, x square plus y square equal to constant is in this case the level line if you like or level curve if you like, level curves this is nothing but equation to a circle because I am looking at uh, the surfaces or in this case the curve on which the function remains constant. Now, the gradient is uh, normal to the level curve which is nothing but in the radial direction. You can see it why because grad phi from for this function is dou phi by dou x which is 2 x times i plus dou phi by dou y which is 2 2 y times i which is nothing but 2 times the vector r. So, this illustrates the point you see the, the idea is this that uh, the I simply uh, the, my picture as I showed you was a, a cup like structure and if I want to put a level surface that is curve along which my value of the function remains constant then this is the type of intersection that I have. So, the question is that why are we studying the gradients? The idea is this that um, we will be very much interested in finding out uh, you are all familiar what are known as the equipotential surfaces. That is surfaces on which the potential function remains constant that is my equivalent to the level surface. And the direction of the gradient that is which is normal to such equipotential surface. I am anticipating what I will be doing in my next class and that is obviously the direction of the gradient. Now, which if I take the level surface to be equipotential surface, then my direction of the gradient is the direction of the electric field. In this particular example, I have shown that phi of x y is x square plus y square. So, gradient of phi is 2 times the unit vector r and that is what is expected in the radial direction because that is normal to the level curve which is a circle. Now, I am left with uh, one last thing in uh, my discussion of the vector and that is to talk about the divergence of a vector field. Now, let me first explain the, the concept of a divergence. The, the top thing here defines divergence though this is not a definition which you will be requiring very often. So, what we say is this we have already defined what is a surface integral. So, what I do is this that I take I have a volume and I cut that volume into many small volumes as you can see I have done here. This is a big volume here and I have split it by cut it into two different volumes. Now, when I have cut it into two different volumes and I can do that many many. So, volume surfaces of each constituent volume. Now, 
if I take a small enough volume and then calculate the surface integral over its surfaces. What I mean by that is this, supposing this is my volume, in this case I have shown you that I have cut it into two. Now, I am saying that I'm supposing this is my smallest unit, then I take the surface integral over the six faces that I have in this cube. Now, then if I divide it by the volume of this uh, element and if I make this volume small enough, then this quantity its limit when delta v is very small is the definition of divergence. Now, let us see why. Now, first thing that you notice is this that when I have the bigger surface, then uh, I am illustrating with two surfaces, but you can imagine this should be true with all the six surfaces. So, for example, on the top surface the outward normal is this and on the bottom surface the outward normal is that. And similarly, on the right surface it will be towards this, on the left surface it will be towards this, on the front surface it will be towards me, on the uh, back surface it will be away from me. Now, when I have spliced it into two, then the my concept changes because on the top surface here it is there, it is this way, but now the intermediate surface their directions are opposite because this is the outward normal to this surface, this is the outward normal to this surface and of course, the bottom surface is as same as before. Now, and this I could do it for all the stacked volumes for with respect to which I have done the splitting. So, the point is this. So, if I take a large enough volume and, and keep on cutting it back, uh, make it into smaller and smaller volumes like this. You notice that because the interfacial surfaces have their outward normals opposite to each other, the surface integrals from these will cancel out. And in the aggregate volume, what I will be left with will only be the surfaces which are not in the interfacial surfaces, but the outside surface of the main volume. So, what is this divergence? What does it actually tell me? Basically, a divergence tells you what is by how much does a vector field spread out. Now, let me give an example to you. You look at this picture, you notice that the vector fields again here I have drawn the vector fields, plotted the vector fields using a Mathematica and I have taken a convenient two dimensional plot. So, you can see that the vector fields are spreading out in each of the quadrants. So, here this is an example of where my divergence of the vector field is positive. And the if you look at the picture on the right, you notice that the, uh, the fields are being directed inwards. Now, this is an example where my divergence is negative. So, let me um, finally, try to complete this by the best way of understanding divergence is to assume that there is a fluid flowing through a volume. So, suppose I have a fluid which is passing through and inside a fluid uh, I have put in uh, a volume and so uh, you notice that I am asking the question how much fluid is flowing through uh, the surface. Now, notice take the left hand surface. Now, in this case my direction of the surface is towards my left, towards my left. In other words, the direction of the uh, in this, this is the y axis, this is the x axis, the z axis. So, direction of this surface is along minus j. Now, if my density of the liquid is rho, the velocity uh, y component of the velocity is v y, then the mass of the fluid which is flowing through this surface is given by. Uh, v y d x d z and the surface is uh, in the negative direction. And similarly, that since the velocity could have changed in going from here to there, I have if the velocity in this surface is v y, the velocity in that surface is v y plus dou v y by d y d y times d x d z. And so, therefore, what is the net increase in the amount of fluid which is inside this volume? 
So, notice that this is coming in, this is going out. So, therefore, decrease or increase will depend upon what is the sign of this, but minus dVy by dy dx dy dz. Now, the question is this that where did this come from? So, let me again uh, use the this quantity is my net increase in this and supposing I take now my three dimension then I will have since notice this is dx dy dz. So, if I considered fluid coming from all directions I can write this as minus dvx by dx plus minus dvy by dy minus dvy by dz. So, therefore, this would be given by minus of this quantity times dx dy dz which by definition of the divergence in minus del dot v dx dy dz. Where did it come from? Now, since the volume is fixed, the rate of increase in the mass could have come in because there is a change in the density. So, which is nothing but d rho by dt dx dy dz, which if you equate the two, you get the equation to the continuity equation. Now, here is a more pictorial representation of what the divergence of a field looks like. Here I have taken a field which is x square y i plus x y square j. You can easily calculate the divergence which is 4 x y here because del dot uh, f x uh, uh, the divergence is d f x by d x. So, this is uh, your uh, f x and since I am doing only a partial with respect to x I get 2 x y and another 2 x y from here which is 4 x y. On the other hand if I take the our old uh, example f equal to x i minus y j the divergence of obviously 0. Now, you can see it what is happening here. See when I am in the first quadrant where x is positive y is positive 4 x y is positive you can see that the divergence is positive everywhere. Now, come to for example, the fourth quadrant in the fourth quadrant x is negative y is negative okay. again the divergence is positive. The you can uh, look at it that by, by taking a small area and you can realize whether the divergence is positive or negative. On the other hand look at this here, here the divergence is 0. If you take a circle like this you notice the amount of things coming in is equal to the amount of things going out and that gives me the divergence to be equal to 0. In the next session I will derive the necessary equation connected with the divergence of the vector field. Thank you.